I think we can all be friendly with each other and like each other, but we can't live together or communicate or anything. It just should be over, you know? What can you do, you know? Anybody else would probably be happy if they had what we have. <laughs> One, two, three, four. The Ramones really invented a whole new genre. I don't know that music would sound the same if it were not for the Ramones. Certainly the Ramones, I thought it should have been like the Stones or something. I mean, they were, they were, yeah. they were so, they influenced so much stuff, you know. So. You, all you hear now in, in car commercials and TV commercials is our Ramones guitars. I mean, this is, this music saved rock and roll. It influenced, you know, millions of kids around the world, and they were never ignored. Something very unusual is happening here tonight, and that's that this industry is, is paying some respect to the Ramones. So with the power invested in me, I'd like to induct the Ramones. Believe it or not, we really loved each other, even when we weren't acting civil to each other. We were truly brothers. The honor of our induction to the Hall of Fame means a lot to us, but it really meant everything to Joey. Thank you very much. How do you feel coming back here? Do you feel anything at all? No. I, you know, this place has sort of lost its thing for me. It doesn't even feel like home. But this is where we used to hang out a lot. But... Wouldn't you know it? Looks like it's closed off. Barbed wire up there. It means that times have changed. Time is, time is great. He's very important. I mean, he's, he talked us into me and Didi starting a band. I mean, uh, he was bugging me and Didi for about a year to start a band. You know, we told him it was sick, and we, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> At the time of our teens, we all lived in Forest Hills. It had a lot of hills. Forest Hills does have too many hills, and Queens Boulevard is too wide to cross. With that. A lot of people get hit by cars there. And all the... The kids there were more like taking LSD and marijuana and, you know, were more sophisticated, like young college students types. <laughs> I don't think John and I and Tommy fit in there one bit. Because we're all kind of outcasts. Maybe at, at one point, maybe loners more so, you know? How did you meet those guys? They all said... I, oh, I heard you like the Stooges, something like that. You know, I said, yeah, you know, I like them. Like maybe three people like the Stooges in the whole area. And everybody else was like violently against them. So if you like the Stooges, you had to be friends with each other. No fun for my baby. No fun. We had one friend, like Richie Stern, and he was the, the leader of the Stooges fans. So through him, we would like hang out and stiff glue or smoke pot. And listen to our, we had a live Stooges tape. We always play it, you know, as part of hanging out. Listening to Iggy and watch Richie sing like Iggy a little bit for us. <laughs> 
During the, the summer months, uh, we would hang out in the area of Forest Hills, and there was one particular hangout that was called Thorneycroft. It was an apartment complex which had a courtyard. When I was a kid, I grew up on the block and met Johnny when I was real young. Bought my first pack of firecrackers from him. He had a little bit of a volatile personality. Yeah, he was cool with me, it's just that, you know, other people he might have not been so cool with. I seen him pop this guy's father in the face. Because my windows are right up here. And I was looking down, and he got into a fight and must have started with the kid, and the kid's father came up to the playground, and he, like, popped him in the nose. Popped the father in the nose. But, you know, things like that happen when you're hanging out. I was bad. I was bad every minute of the day, from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed. Really? Anything really? I could think of to do, I'd do it. Really? Stole, stuff like that. Yeah. 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 I know my mother watching this. <laughs> John went off to college a, uh, a week before I did, because he went down to Florida. So he goes down to Florida, OK? So we all had like a farewell party for him. Uh, the next week, I come out of my uh, house. I'm walking up the hill towards Tony Croft. And there sits John. I said, what are you doing? What are you doing here? He says, I didn't like it down there. to 20 was a trying period, figuring out what to do with yourself. So I was uh, sort of a delinquent at that point. Do you think the Ramones saved you from that kind of... Oh, no. I already grew out of that stuff already. I grew out of it by the time I was 20. I was walking on the block one day, and uh, it just hit me. It was like a voice going, what are you doing? Is this what you're here for? This is what God put us here for. And uh, went home and stopped everything. I plotted out the rest of my, uh, what I was going to do with myself. Mm. What, what was okay to do, what wasn't okay to do. Just changed in a matter of one minute. Hey, Joey, I didn't know that well. Joey was, was sort of quiet. He was kind of reclusive and shy, and, uh, and I realized that he was not like the other kids. He was a loner. And Joey, I don't know, he was difficult. He used to leave his brother's albums on the radiator and stuff like that and, you know, not put them back in the cover and they'd be melted. Steal everybody's hash. I think. We were walking down the street at night and Jeff was so tall I mean, I'd be looking up to Jeff, Jeff, like this, you know? What's up? He goes, hey, hey, yeah, what's up, man? Hey, hey. You know, that was, that was Jeff, man. It was like, to me, he was like freaky, man, you know? He was like, but he was cool. He was, he, was, he was together upstairs, you know? He knew his stuff. He looked funny, but he was together upstairs, you know? The projections for him from childhood was, were not good. And teacher said, you know, he's... His eyes are bad, he's, you know, he's not reading well. He was a slow student, but they didn't think about his basic intelligence. He was highly intelligent and very, very creative. They didn't even look at that side of him. Joey, when he was about, I guess, 18, um, decided to check himself into St. Vincent's. Because he was having a really hard time um, with his condition called OCD, right? The obsessive compulsive disorder. He would hear voices that may forced him to repeat things. I did take him to to a specialist. They said he was compulsive. So they would just tell my mother that that this guy has uh, an emotional disorder that is probably going to render him uh, useless. In, to function in society for the re for the remainder of his life, we were all worried about what was going to become of him. Yeah, I mean, music really was my salvation, and it always has been. I mean, it, for me, it's something very special. You know, what I mean, it's like um, I remember like times I was like really miserable, or um, 
you know, really depressed, you know, and I put on a, a nice soothing record like the Stooges, because it, it would be like an exorcism, Powerful, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, oh, like just it. like a, a total release, you know. Down. I saw my brother on stage with this band Sniper. Now, he was never a singer in a band before. He was already on when I walked in. And I see him up there, and I see this guy who had gone through a transformation because he wasn't pretty. Now, Johnny didn't like your brother when he found out. Right? He didn't get along with my brother. He didn't really even want to know him because my brother was kind of a, um, I don't want to say a freak. We were all freaks, you know. Uh, but he was a, more of a hippie freak. I guess, and John, even though he was, um, you know, he, he was not a, he, he tried to come off like a right-wing conservative, but he was also a big Charles Manson advocate. <laughs> All those guys were into the, the, you know, the glitter scene. John was wearing satin pants and, you know, chinchilla coats. I guess that's where John and my brother found the connection. Well, you know, me and John, we, we go see the Stooges and, you know, we all got kind of turned on to the MC5 about, you know, the same time, and Alice Cooper. But, like, were any girls ever involved in the, at this stage of the game? Never, no. Any girls in Forest Hills would leave there to find a man somewhere else, to East Village or something, you know what I mean? You wouldn't want anybody. It wasn't cool to be from Queens. You, you would lie about it. If you went into Manhattan, you, would, you wouldn't tell them, oh, I got, I got an apartment in the city, you know. And then you'd go back to your mom's house. <laughs> so it was just the guys hanging out. And Joey and me, you know, and John and me and Richie Stern, and you know, with their platform shoes and doing your hair for two hours and all. And that's all. We just like maybe be able to make it to Thomas' car, and that's about as much of a production as everybody could. There was nowhere to go after that. Later, there was when the dolls started playing. When I say I'm in love, you best believe I'm in love, L-U-V. Their shows would be like these real eventful kind of nights that everybody came down. It was real decadent, but great. You know, great songs, great energy, you know, real wild stage antics. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was just the best thing in the world. Per There's nobody they could compete with. But I was just gone because it was just the music. It was just incredible. And, come here, and clothes and stuff. And the freaks running around. It was great. And then they'd make that long trip home back to Queens. <laughs> it was rough. I saw where the musicianship was going at that point in time. This is the drug era coming into rock and roll, so everyone was getting into the overindulgence of their playing. solos and felt no way can I ever be able to play like this. Uh, even if you have the talent, you have to sit there for 15 years practicing. All of a sudden I went to see the New York Dolls play. I was seeing bands now that what rock and roll was supposed to be, seeing how great they could sound and how great they could be with limited musicianship. So finally, John calls me up one day and says, oh, I brought a guitar. And they said, uh, and I'm talking to Dee Dee and everything. I said, let's get together and talk about it. Maybe we can put something together. I had just uh, left another band, and Dee Dee liked uh, my style. And so he mentioned to John that he wanted me in the band. So the two people that we knew then would be Joey played drums, me and Dee Dee were gonna play guitar. Tommy was our, our advisor. Tommy then would go, make Dee Dee the bass player, you play the guitar. And Dee Dee would sing but he couldn't sing and play at the same time so when he was singing he wasn't playing when he was playing he wasn't singing <laughs> and then joey would sing uh lo and behold he had this great voice tommy really pushed the joey issue especially as a singer mm. so it's not my idea of a singer but tommy said no he's gonna look good in between you and Dee." so um when we decided to have joey become the singer 
We needed a drummer. We kept trying drummers out and drummers out, and then one day no one showed up to try someone out, and Tommy just sat in, and we convinced Tommy in too that it was sounding right with Tommy, and we convinced him to stay in the band. So, but at first I was very rushed. I didn't ever play drums, so it took me a little while, uh, you know, to to just be able to do that, uh, which fit in with their playing because they were kind of learning how to play themselves. But as soon as I started playing drums, the, the whole sound of the band changed. It started uh, to gel to become the Ramones. Well, Didi was using the surname Didi Ramon. Ramon was, the way we had, the way we were gonna be using it was uh, to create a sense of unity, you know? And a bond of sorts. Uh, Joey's mother had uh, an art gallery, and, and we were in the art gallery, and this was after closing, um, and we were rehearsing some of the songs. And, uh, and Dee Dee and Joey were running down Judy's a Punk. That's the first time I heard Judy's a Punk. I had never heard anything like this. This was something uh, that was futuristic. And I said, what is this? What are these lyrics they're singing? What is this melody? What is this crazy harmony? You know, and then it's all gelling, and I'm listening to this, and I'm going, this is brilliant stuff. And from then, you know, it, it, I became very serious because it wasn't just a glitter rock band like uh, 50 other glitter rock bands in New York. This was something fantastic. New from k -Tel Records, 22 explosive hits, 22 original stars, gallery. Oh, it's so nice to be with you. Husbands During the early 70s, it was Davis the doldrums. Pop -tops, the, the spirit of rock and roll sort of went away. And many more, only three ninety nine. In that time and in that culture, you know, Donnie and Marie are on TV. Everybody's nice. Everything just seemed so mediocre and tedious. It was just awful. You know, and everything was kind of earth shoes. Everything was muted. You know, everything was browns. You know, it was wheat groats, and and we didn't like that. And you couldn't get laid unless you, you know, were spiritually correct or gave them some rap about like macrame. You know, I don't know what you were supposed to do, but I, I couldn't do it. You know, it was the end of white flight in New York. You know, ever since World War II. People had been moving out of the cities to these new things called the suburbs. So people were really leaving New York, and it was kind of deserted. And you really got this feeling that, you know, the parents had left, and you, you could take over and do whatever you want. In the early 1970s, New York was empty. There was, not, there was no clubs. The reason we played CBGBs was there was no place to play. We saw a uh, tiny little ad in, in the voice. Uh, television were playing there. I saw, like, a lot of good shows there. I love television. That was CBGB's to me. So some lonely night with 10 people there on television playing. Tom Delaney's me, the Venus de Milo song. <laughs> it was great, you know. I remember the first time I walked in the CBGBs, there was sawdust all over the floor, and um, there was piles of dog shit everywhere. It was like walking over a minefield, you know? And so we, uh, we auditioned for Hilly Crystal, and Hilly said, um, nobody's gonna like you guys, but I'll have you back. We walk into CBGBs. It's literally a Bowery bar. I mean, there's Bowery bums at the bar, you know, counting out their pennies to buy, you know, a shot. And then there's like 10, people sitting at these tables. At that point, the Ramones came out, and they hit the stage, and they were all wearing these black leather jackets, and they counted off the song, and they started playing different songs, you know? And it was just this wall of noise. And they threw down their guitars in disgust and walked off the stage. And they looked so like, you know, it looked like the SS had just walked in. You know, they looked so striking. I mean, these guys were not hippies. You know, this was something completely new. And the noise of it was just, it just hit you. And then two minutes later, they came back. And Dee Dee counted off one, two, three, four. And they went into Blitzkrieg Bop.
played really fast and really short songs. And it, it, was, it was just very funny, but they were very earnest about it. It wasn't that, you know, they were trying to be funny. They were really serious. And so it was almost like, you know, conceptual art or something that it was just so great. You, you couldn't believe that, you know, it, it could exist. <laughs> it made you smile. You know, once you managed to close your mouth, because <laughs> at first it was like... first person that came up to us was Alan Vega from Suicide and said, you guys are great. This is what I've been waiting for. And I thought, this guy's nuts. <laughs> first fan. <laughs> I watched him, it was like I was laughing, you know, because I was more a st serious musician, you know, coming from the different groups I came from. And watching the Ramones, it was like, it's like a joke, really. <laughs> They had a sound problem, and Dee Dee got all pissed off and took his bass guitar and threw it on the ground. And I think they walked off, and then they came back on. And that, that was exciting, too. I'd never seen any, any spontaneous uh, anger like that from anybody. And that, that's what made me a little bit scared of them. You know, the famous thing about Ramones is they would always stop and start you know, and have arguments on stage, which I always thought was pretty endearing. Love. I don't want to go down to the basement! see an original band, you know? You went to a stadium to see some big band. And you, when you went to a bar, they played cover tunes, you know? So actually seeing guys who wrote their own music and, and did their own thing and wore black leather jackets and, you know, it was kind of amazing. I felt, my God, this is it. Initially, CBGB's was about 100 people, and four of those people were the Ramones, and five of those people were the people in Blondie, and do the math, as they say, and, uh, there was a few other bands, and that's who was there. Everybody would hang out outside of the club, and it was, a, you know, there was like, a, I guess, a decent kind of camaraderie to some degree. CBGB's, like, I, I remember, like, the early bands there, it was getting to be a nightmare, you know, the competition. Well, with the Mumps, uh, Mink DeVille, and the Marbles, all these, these jerk-off bands, you know, like, thought they were, like, big stars, and they weren't. The Ramones were the stars. You know, and, and like we were very standoffish and very snobby, so we irritated the hell out of everyone. We're the Ramones, and you're a lad, Matt, baby. You better shut it up. One, two, three, four. The, their concept was very well defined. They were very organized. But yeah, they were like the military. They were, I mean, they really had a very clear vision and it was very tight. After the failure of the New York Dolls to achieve commercial success, um, it was like a black cloud over New York and nobody was going to be signed in New York. and. Um, more people start coming down to CBG because there was like an abundance of artists. Talking Heads are doing something totally different. Television, I didn't see it, no competition. Heartbreakers were a whole bunch of junkies, so um, I knew that their careers were going to be short, so. And around summer of 75, uh, there was a CBGB's rock festival. This is a big thing at the time. You know, uh, well, Rolling Stone's actually covering this, you know, and one page article and three quarters of the page was on the Ramones. At that point, then we started selling out once it was the Rolling Stones thing. You know, I'd shot the Ramones live 
once, mainly at CBGB's, but it was really early, and then it would, it would get so crowded you couldn't really do that anymore. <laughs> people a night, playing three nights in a row. We raised the price of the tickets to be the first one, raising them to $2 and $3 and $4 and $5. And we'd always try to take as much control, you know, get it away from Hilly and the crazy wife. Oh you know, yeah, we'd want someone at the door, we want to be cheated by them. Uh, we looked at this as a business right from right at that point. But we built a big following. We kept sending out invitations, trying to get Danny Fields come down. He thought, because uh, of his history, he worked for the Doors, and he worked for uh, the Stooges, and he worked for the MC5. So I figured with those credentials, that this guy, maybe if anybody's going to see what we're doing, it would be Danny. Danny Fields came down eventually, and uh, I think he w he didn't want to come down because he thought we were like a Spanish band or something, for like a flamenco band or something. So I went to see them the next time they played. It this is just everything. No guitar solos. The songs are over so fast. They're all so cute. They look great. I love what they're wearing. And I just said right away, I want to be your manager. So they said, uh, oh, well, we need a few thousand dollars for a drum kit. If you come up with that, you can be our manager. OK. <laughs> you knew all those people, I mean, as far as cool people, not anybody's going to help us with our career, but, you know, he always knew all those Andy Warhol people. And so, mm -hmm. so all those people started coming down. To me, it was just like a bunch of freaks, and uh, I wouldn't be very sociable or friendly to these people. Uh, I just came off as unfriendly and nasty, which they, they were fine with. Uh, they probably wanted the abuse. So, uh. And this was my first part. I got a deal. Or the Patty had a deal, I think. I mean, that was the first thing you had to do. I remember playing at Mother's, this must be later on in 75, and Craig Leon brings down Linda Stein. I guess eventually it leads to getting Seymour Stein to come see us. Danny organized a rehearsal at SIR Studios. They did their set, probably took 15 minutes, and that was it, Seymour signed them. One, two, three, four. I heard in the Ramones what I look for first in, in any artist that I, that, that I sign, which is great songs, because to me that is the most important thing. The first album, <clears throat> Seymour comes down to the recording thing, he please start saying I'm a Nazi baby uh, on the front, uh, you love tomorrow the world, and going, what's wrong with that, you know? And, Say, oh, come on, guys, please, for me, you know, change to something, you know? And we like, reluctantly changed it, so we were compromising ourselves, just not singing, I'm a Nazi baby. You know, I Don't Want to Walk Around With, with You was um, a love song <laughs> that Didi wrote about his uh, girlfriend at the time. We didn't try to be crazy. We didn't try to write things that were offensive or shock value. We, these things, this is all natural. This is, uh, we're trying to be normal, uh, so. You were trying to be normal when you failed. Yeah. <laughs> we looked at each other and just couldn't stop staring at the cover. And that's all we could listen to. It instantly made half of our album collection obsolete. Our music is just kind of part of what the Ramones are about. I mean, uh, it's in part music, but then it's, um, there's a, a lot of living in there. They were, in one way, as real as real could be. You, you could have been walking down on the corner of 53rd and 3rd and really seen Dee Dee Ramone, you know, hustling. Uh, 53rd and 3rd in New York City was a very famous um, chicken hawk corner where if you wanted to go pick up a boy, prostitute, you would drive up to 53rd and 3rd, and they'd all be standing on the street. And Dee, Dee wrote a song about turning tricks there. We'd like to wish Seymour Stein a very happy birthday, and we'd like to dedicate this set to him.
what happens in the song is he's lamenting that he's the one they never pick. And then when a guy finally does... Petey, what, like, you know, 53rd and 3rd, what, what's the true story behind 53rd and 3rd? There's lots of rumors. I'd rather bypass that, you know. These rumors, like, nobody's really giving me, like, a fair chance at, like, what is real and what is fantasy. And you know, everybody always blows up the negative, you know. And, like, people try to make me out like I was, like, some... Rough character. I was just a bass player in the Ramones, you know. They should take a look at themselves, you know. Wayne County was the DJ at Max's Kansas City upstairs. He just got the f copy of the first album. I never heard anything like this before in my life. Uh, I was blown away. It was something I never heard before. It was so stripped down and so powerful that at one point I said, Shit, I wish I was in this band. for Johnny Winter was a huge star at the time in Waterbury, Connecticut. And we, we thought that we were going to go over. We thought that these, these people are going to hear us and going to go, wow, this is amazing. Boy, are we lucky to see this band. Well, that's not quite what happened. In fact, we were kind of lucky because, see, there was no pauses between our songs. We'd go from one song to another. And, but when we stopped for, to take our jackets off to do I Want to Be a Boyfriend, this slow crescendo of <laughs> I'm supposed to be like the stage roadie and uh, I find myself hiding behind the martial amps because bottles are getting tossed like you know every 10 seconds <laughs> and every and the, everybody's yelling get the fuck off the stage we were lucky they didn't murder us you know the Ramones are not an opening act I mean Whoever you came to see, they will confuse you as an opening act. In America at the time, you couldn't even get a star, you know, nobody really cared. Oh, you know, outside of Rolling Stone and Village Voice, nobody else, you know. But in England, they, we actually created a star. Joey said, I gotta go to England. And I was going, why do you have to go to England? You know, because England didn't seem that important. I mean, they couldn't get a job in New Jersey, you know. Well, I mean, I've been aware and the Pistols have been aware of the New York scene through Malcolm McLaren. He used to hang about in his shop, and he'd been backwards and forwards to America, and he, in fact, he'd been involved in managing the New York Dolls. If that Ramones record hadn't existed, I don't know that we could have built a scene here because it fulfilled a vital gap, if you like, between the death of the old pub rocking scene and the advent of punk. July 4th, 1976, we went over to England. We played this um, place called the Roundhouse in Hill 3000, and, and it was sold out. There were people waiting at the hotel to sleep with us all. You know, I mean, you can tell it's pretty good if you got a, people lined up to fuck the roadies and, and the managers. You know, during, during the sound check that day, all these kids came over to us and told us how we were responsible for turn, turning them on, basically. Uh, for them to go out and form their own bands. Everyone who was in a 
kind of band, who was going to be in one of the, the UK punk bands was there at the show. I think there must have been about 60 people in the audience, which is like sort of nobody, but everyone formed a band, you know. They kick-started the whole thing in a, in a big way. There were stranglers, the pistols, and the Clash the Damned. We knew how to get to the back stage window. And so when the Ramones were getting ready to, to do their concert, I was there, Simo, Jonesy, some of the Six Pistols. We were in the back alley and we threw a rock at the window. And I, th I think Johnny Ramone stuck his head out and went, what? And we went, hey, this is the Clash and this is the Pistols and we need to get in. And so they kind of formed a, a sort of human chain and pulled us up through this window. And that was the first time we met him and it was just a really great punk rock moment. John Rodden, I didn't know who he was. He's trying to come in on a side door. He says he wants to meet the band, but he's afraid. He's asking me if he comes in and meets the band, will they beat him up? Everybody thinks that the Ramones are a gang from the Bronx or something like that. Paul Simonon uh, wants to know, gee, you're so big, you sold this out, and we're from England, and we haven't even performed yet because we're not good enough. And Johnny said, oh, wait till you see us, we stink. You don't have to be good, just get out there and play. Hi everybody, it's great to be here tonight. Happy Fourth of July. It was like white heat because of the constant barrage of the, of the tunes. You know, you couldn't put a cigarette paper between one tune ending and the next beginning. You see, a lot of people, I think, doubters were probably over there, the industry, thinking, oh, this is punk rock shambles. You know, it's going to be drunk people falling over. And they weren't ready for, like, a pile driver going, ah, and then, like, you couldn't have got tighter, you know, if you'd been in New Orleans all your life, because it was unbelievable. Fourth of July week in 1976. And I remember going over to the loft and just hanging out on the stoop waiting for Jody. I didn't know what to do. Like, where's Jody? When's Jody coming back? So I, he came back and he said, no, like, they really, really liked us. You know, and I said, really? I was like, wow, you know, that's great. I didn't have any understanding of how significant and important it was. It was just, oh, someone didn't throw bottles at you. That's great, you know. He was excited, but it was over because what do you, you know, you're not rich or famous. You're, and, and, and you come home and you still, you still can't get, you know, you get New Haven, Connecticut or something, you know, toads, to beg for toads. I was making, they were paying me $50 a week to roadie for them. I was going broke. And they were broke too, and Arturo had this big loft, and uh, everybody just wound up staying there. Yeah, so Joey's bed used to be all the way in the back. And Didi probably used to have a mattress on the floor that moved around all the time. Uh, because he kept burning the floor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he really took good care of Joey and I. We were like kids, you know, and uh, had no idea how to clean the loft or anything. And he put, he was the one, he put up with it for the sake of art. He thought the Ramones were some kind of art thing. And Connie did live here for a while. I kicked him out because of the fights. Who oh, did? Connie. Connie was a prostitute. Blonde, big blonde, big breasts, big girl, who um, was Dee Dee's girlfriend. And they were both heroin addicts together. Connie was psycho. When Connie was with Arthur Kane from the New York Dolls, she got mad, and while he was sleeping, she took a knife and tried to saw his thumb off so he couldn't play bass again. Oh, man. Heavy duty, she was into drugs, but a very heavy person, you know, very She's intense. Very she stood toe to toe with him. They'd have fights, man. Whew. I remember once Dee took a, like a half a dollar and stuck it in his fist with it sticking out and hit her, you know? My job, actually, was to keep Connie out in the parking lot while they were playing shows. It was kind of tough for me, because John would be trying to get me to 
keep Connie away from them. And then on the other hand, Dee Dee, she was his girlfriend. You know, some girl was always trying to steal Dee Dee off. And I think that's basically the fights between him and Connie were about. And Connie was very protective of her man, who was becoming this rock star. We like that. What? I don't know, you know. You know. You don't? We don't know. We have... Why? Nothing makes us like it. We don't, we don't have any control over it. <laughs> Joey had to become a rock star because he stuck out anyway. So he had to do something with this. Instead of getting, you know, shit on by people, he had to become... You know, I don't think he really had a choice. The first thing that I remember that really made me realize something is really happening here from my brother. We were hanging out at CBGB's. This guy, Joe Stevens, a photographer, wants to take a picture, right? And he says to me, excuse me, uh, can you step away from Joey, please? I, you know, I could tell my brother felt a little strange about it because we looked at each other and, you know, laughed and I said, yeah, go for it, and, you know, no problem, you know? Then all of a sudden, he starts coming out of his shell a little bit, getting a little bit of confidence. And yeah, all of a sudden, the you know, girls are paying attention to him. Girls that weren't on medication. <laughs> well, after eight weeks on the road, I wanna be well. Every city was a goddamn struggle. Boston, Rochester, New Haven, Philadelphia. In the United States, they were stunted here. It was horrible, you know? You couldn't get on the radio. The media here was, like, against them. We were always kind of getting blacklisted because um, I guess the um, industry didn't want the boat rock. I guess they were hoping that we, want, we would kind of disappear, you know? We always played some place where no band had ever played before. Remember a lot of the... Um, Places we play would have, still have the um, disco balls on the ceiling, you know? They left a legacy of bands, kids, no future people, no future. Maybe we have a future. We thought we had no future. Look at them. They can't play. They're terrible. They don't know more than three, no, maybe two notes. They're. But look, this is exciting. They're big, they're famous, everyone's here. They can get laid. Let's start a band. And I swear to you, every place we went to, there were bands that did not exist when the Ramones first played there. And when they came back, they did. You're Pied Pipers out there. And, of course, I felt that we're the best at what we do. I, I couldn't see another band out there and say, this band's better than us. So. It's King of the Hill. Well, actually, actually, for that one moment in time, I did think someone was as good, and that was The Clash. On the second album tour, I was like, shit, these guys are as good as us. Joey got White Riot in a single. And we took it out of the sleeve, and Joey put it on this little record player. We both looked at each other and said, my god, they're just copying you guys. Completely. Yeah. All of a sudden, this English thing getting bigger and bigger, and we're still in the Bowery trying to get 75 cents for a quart of beer, you know? Like, nothing's changed. So, you know, it, it kind of makes you a little like, well, wait a minute. We've been doing this first. We don't get anything. And then when the Sex Pistols album came out, it was great. It was a great album. You know, not only did Malcolm steal the scene and repackage it, but the music was good. There's no question that the Ramones suffered greatly because the Sex Pistols were so famous for vomiting and bleeding and scratching and smelling and anarchy. And so this followed them here and the Sex Pistols dominating the headlines. An English rock band which has somehow developed a following by spitting into the audience, which frequently responds by throwing bottles at the band, has come to this country saying it is here to rip some dollars off the Yanks. We kind of felt us and the Sex Pistols would become almost like the Beatles and the Stones of the 60s, you know what I mean? Like we were the new revolution, let's say, you know? 
it wasn't going to work like that. It was just giving such a negative feeling off that it was just going to destroy the whole thing, which is which would end up happening. It just scared everyone else off and scared off the music industry and scared off the radio. Remember, like, I, I had written a song called Sheen is a Punk Rocker, and I played it for Seymour Stein, and he flipped out and he said, we got to get this right out. And the record was doing really well. And then one day on 60 Minutes was um, the thing about the Sex Pistols and the, uh, the safety pins and everyone gouging each other's eyeballs out and the strangulation and this and that. And, uh, and everybody flipped out and then things changed radically. It really uh, kind of screwed things up for ourselves. And when their records went around to radio stations, so in Intuitive, like, what do I know about them? Oh, they're trouble. They throw up. If we play their record, we'll probably have to have them here, and then they'll throw up on the console in the recording studio, and then Broad and we don't want them. It's don't play the record. It's easier. Don't play the record. It's always easier not to do something than to do it. I mean, those songs are, are classic American pop songs. Why weren't they played on the radio? Why weren't they? Right up, we ever got they called us punks in a punk band. You know, that's where it started. But after, after that, they kept calling us punk. Tommy was our main spokesman at that point. He would do most of the interviews, and uh, he felt it was very important that the band come off sounding intelligent, and uh, and because we were getting this cartoon dumb image, so we we're trying to keep the interviews to basically him and me. And I was not very friendly, so I wasn't really wanting to talk to anyone. So it was, it was left with him. It was Johnny's band. Johnny was the inside manager. He was the disciplinarian. There was no question. We had to deal with Dee Dee on an important subject. I mean, Dee Dee's very smart, but Dee Dee is trouble. Dee Dee lives to be trouble. He lives to be that awful six-year-old. And Joey was trouble. He was so frail. He was always getting sick. He couldn't come down a staircase. Johnny was trouble. He punched Dee Dee in the head after the show if he missed them. They were all trouble. Uh, that's a band. I mean, you know, it's rock and roll. We play so loud and all the amps couldn't take it, but now we got these amps that they, they could, they're really, they, they work. You know, we can really push them and we could blow this place apart if we wanted to. We'd set up everything. The Ramones were all crazy. I mean, can you imagine being in a van with Dee Dee and Johnny and Joey for the rest of your life? I was in the van a lot. I and mean, let me tell you, it wasn't fun. Oh, we should be sitting in a fucking van. Come on, Joey. We're gonna get to Buffalo tonight. He would come down the steps, go back up because he didn't touch every other step or something. He was 
superstitious, but beyond, it was compulsive behavior. You had to touch every other picket on the food. That's why, across the street, he'd start to cross the street, come back, he'd start to cross the street, he'd come back. Ah! I remember they would sit with their girlfriends, you know, Connie and Dee Dee would be there. And I remember John, Johnny just saying, she's a pig, what are you doing with her? What are you, what are you doing with a pig? I mean, just go to Dee Dee, you know, and Dee Dee just, you know, freaking out, going, ah! And he pulling out that huge 007 knife, gravity knife, you know? And I was between them, you know, and Dee Dee's lunging with this huge knife to stab, and Johnny's going, what are you gonna do, kill me? You gonna kill me? As far as business goes, Johnny was right on the ball. He knew how to run that organization and business and all the aspects of put, making sure the group had certain rules and stuck with them, which I respected a lot. His personality sucked. It was a controlling, I don't know, was, uh, you know, it's very, very controlling personality and difficult. <sighs> he was just trying to um, take advantage of a once in a lifetime situation, try to be an adult about it. And we were really dysfunctional and we drove him crazy. Seems and like the father. He was unpleasant enough as it is, so like on top of that, you know, we just instigated him into becoming a monster. <laughs> like a sergeant in the army or something like that, maybe not everyone can handle that. But you need, you need someone to make the decision. Someone's got someone's to do something, otherwise just flounder around, you know? I think he made a lot of sacrifices for the band, too. You know, he had to put up with a lot of aggravation. And I think everybody in the band's behavior offended him. He didn't want anybody doing drugs, you know? You know, I don't want to conform to someone's ways all the time, either. And um, I think in the Ramones, I really, really, really had to conform. Dee Dee, you know, he always expressed all this frustration about having being locked into the bowl haircut, and, you know, he wanted to dress differently and, you know, have punk rock hair. And so I think Dee Dee felt very frustrated by that, because, you know, he came up from that uh, more Jerry Nolan, Johnny Thunders, looking good, dressing with the styles and all that. Instead, he had to have the uniform, you know, it was like this regimented, here's your uniform, put that on. The whole song Chinese Rocks came about because Dee Dee had written it and then Hell had, wrote, had written one of the verses. But the Ramones didn't want to do it because they didn't want to do any songs about heroin and they didn't, want, and they didn't like Dee Dee hanging out with Johnny and Jerry and Hell because they were all junkies, and they used to get pissed off at him when they found out that he was hanging out with uh, the heartbreakers and whatnot at that time. But we had, like, a dope addict relationship. Not, like, we didn't even bother with playing guitars when we were hanging out and stuff. The heartbreakers were really focused around drugs, and I think Dee Dee probably, you know, he would have liked to be in the, the heartbreakers. You know, wouldn't it be great to be in a band with other junkies? You know? The bands that you really inspired, like Blondie and these people, that have, in a sense, commercially eclipsed you, does that make you mad at all? No. I mean, they, just, they took that way to do that and play, you know, disco music and things like that to make it. Uh, we do what we believe in. We have our integrity. And we're happy doing what we do. The only band yeah! That's... By about the third year, for me, things were getting claustrophobic. Time to lose the band. I don't know. For sure why, I think he just didn't like touring. He didn't like, like being on the road, wanted to be a producer. It was the two different worlds. In the, in the studio, I was in control and, uh, you know, creating. And on the road, I was like, uh, you know, a passenger. Basically being bossed around and uh, not, not treated very well, actually. I felt like I was losing my mind. And I would explain to people, I think I'm losing my mind, and they would go, they would find this amusing, okay? so. The choice was me staying on the road and uh, becoming a vegetable or helping them write the songs and producing the records, which I felt would be a little more productive. 
and bringing in another drummer. No, we were shocked and we tried to convince Tommy to stay. Tom, what are we going to do without Tommy again? This is like a big thing. I mean, uh, but um, Tommy convinced us it'd be no problem at all. You just find another drummer who plays better than him. Okay, <laughs> fine. Then I went to their rehearsals and Tommy Ramone sat behind me. John told me to be on my toes and I knew what he meant, that the songs just kept coming and coming, which was amazing. I never saw that in my life. So, uh, you know, like right away I felt more insecure. You know, is this real? Is this really the Ramones? You know, who are the Ramones? And then Tommy was never really accepted as a Ramone, uh, you know, between the other three because he presented such a conservative front to himself, to the rest of us, when I knew Tommy was a total freak. At the same time, there's certain things that were so wonderful about him that I could never be like him. And I recognized that, and I didn't like it about myself. Tommy was the type of guy, he would buy some potatoes and hamburgers and cook himself a dinner. At 21 years old, that's like really, a, you know, pretty cool thing to do rather than eat some dope and potato chips. Tommy was important to the sound, do you feel? No. No? No. No. I, mean, I never thought, you know, uh, any song I record with different drummers, different bass players, different singers. It always sound like the Ramones. He was pretty important to the sound of the band, don't you think? No. Really? Not at all. I think Tommy was in the right place at the right time. But as far as him being able to claim fame off of it, his artistic credit or anything, come on. You know, give me a break already. It ain't true. High school and uh, come out to Los Angeles to do the tracking. And I th actually thought Tommy was going to be there. And here there's just no Tommy. and. Tommy was sort of in charge. They would listen to me, but then I would discuss it with Tommy. You know, and as long as I would agree with what, what Tommy thought we should do, then Dee Dee would go along. What about Joey? Yeah, less to say, and quieter at that point. In the beginning, Joey didn't really talk that much. He was just kind of enjoying the success that they were having, you know? It was a continuation of his shyness and insecurity, and um, he, he didn't have a full understanding, I don't think, of even what the whole Ramones concept was yet. And didn't really have that much to say and wasn't, w wasn't sure if he should even talk or not because he wasn't supposed to. He seemed like a, an appreciative, harmless guy. Then one day I saw him change in France at a sound check when Tommy was in the band, you know? He got mad at Tommy for being the spokesman of the band. I guess Joey felt like he had something to say also. Because Tommy, you know, he would try and control what, uh, what Joey would say in interviews. He had always been ignored, you know, most of his life. So now he's finally getting some attention and you got guys telling him, this is what you should say, you know, and don't talk about this. And I guess Joey at that point started to kind of rebel and he said, you know, who the fuck are you to tell me what to say? So now Tommy's not there. Uh, Joe even starts to exert his opinion, and, and we don't have Tommy there no more to be the buffer here and decide what, what we should do, what's right, you know. So that, that, that became a problem. The All-American Half-Hound, pure beef patty, lettuce, tomatoes. Then we did the Phil Spector album, that's where I met good old Phil. He was my drinking buddy in Los Angeles for those five weeks that we were there doing End of the Century. Somebody has to be able to do something with this band that everybody says should be the biggest band in the world. So maybe Phil Spector. I was the biggest fan of Phil Spector. And he was a hero of mine. You know, all, all things must pass, and uh, especially all the stuff he did with uh, Lennon was really, sound, sounded exceptionally raw and really great. Because Phil really wanted to do the Ramones record. He, he was convinced that this was going to be the biggest record of the Ramones' career and of his career. It was going to be number one. He would take me in his office and look at me in the face and say, Ed, this is going to be number one, the biggest record ever. He was convincing himself. He did have this kind of insane look in his eye about him. Joey was a Phil Spector fan from, you know, the time we were uh, 9, 10, 11 years old. I mean, every record, even before we knew that they were produced by Phil Spector, we'd buy them, you know. 
and later on find out that, that all about Phil Spector and that he had produced all these bands, put them all together, wrote the songs. You know, Phil Spector was his idol. I mean, to me, Phil's music was always kind of like early punk rock in its own kind of way because Spector was always cutting edge, you know? Uh, I think Phil loved Joey. They had a, a good relationship, and, and Joey is a great singer. I think Phil saw in Joey all the influence of Phil's early stuff. I think that Johnny knew that it was a mistake. Hey, the guy's a producer. Producers are nothing, you know? So he did some good records in the 1960s. Big deal. Was he done lately? This is 15 years later. The guy hasn't had a hit in 15 years. You know, Phil's not in there doing this thing like, we're going to recreate this, or, you know, I'm going to make you the Beatles, or it's just like, man, you rock and roll. You know the New York stuff. It's easy for me. I understand what you guys want to do. That's it's right. It's a no-brainer. Let's right. just go make the record. That's right. You're the Ramones. I'm Phil Spector. You be the Ramones. I'll be Phil Spector, and we'll have an album. Joey working with Phil Spector helped him overcome any kind of insecurities he had more than any other one thing that happened in his career. He was interested in the power of the band, but he was interested in Joey's vocals. And he spent a long time with Joey on the vocals. Phil was kept doing that throughout the whole session before we did it. Joey, 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 Joey. You know, treated us like we weren't even there. And, you know. Phil Spector, he invited us back to his house. And it was like, great, you know, let's go up there and see what it's like. Well, Phil liked to do his preaching and telling them stories about rock and roll, which, you know, Joey's a rock and roll fanatic. Then he started uh, raving and putting on like weird horror movies and things, and, and we've wanted to go, but he he didn't didn't want us to go. He said you're gonna stay here for a while, you know. Yeah, you know, he had his guns and things in the house and stuff. And at one point, Phil pulls out his gun. Wow. Yeah, everybody everyone died behind the couch. <laughs> He's kept us hostage for a while up there. Well, check it out. The Ramones, a garage band, very intellectual, very hip. And all of a sudden, he finds himself working with a serious, hardcore, professional producer of the highest order. He had this little treasure chest of stuff next to him in a cooler. And he would have his manischewitz, some kind of wine in there, in a the thermos. At this point, Phil was drinking, I was drinking, Dee Dee was doing drugs. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of clash of personalities during those uh, sessions. Phil would make them play one note like 60 or 70 times. The Johnny nightmare story of playing that first chord to rock and roll high school. We did like two takes, we went in and listened to it, and Phil played it back. I think I counted around 160 times. To, to Johnny, that must be like the Chinese water torture. So we, you know, I hit the, we hit the chord, and he paces around the room for about three hours cursing, and he would stop the tape, and he would stomp his feet on the floor, go, shit, bitch, fuck, shit, fuck, 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 for God knows what reason. Go back, play the chord again, play the chord, pace it around the room for three more hours, cursing at the engineer and selfing him. And this goes on for like 12 hours. And after three days of this, uh, Johnny decided he's had enough and he couldn't take anyone, so he decided, I'm packing my bags, I'm getting the fuck out of here, I'm on the next plane to New York, bye. You're not leaving, you're not going to. What are you doing? Shoot me, Phil? Go ahead, shoot me. I don't care, I'm leaving. He's a little man with lifts in the shoes, the wig on top of his head, and four guns. I mean, you know, he treats everyone, he's like an asshole to everybody, he treats everybody horrible. And uh, we reluctantly agreed to do the album with him because we thought it would help us. When, when we got the mixes, it was, for me, it just lied kind of on its side. It wasn't the great record that that record could have been, I thought. Uh, when we heard it, uh, personally, I didn't like the drum sound on it. Dee Dee hated it. But I think the songs were very good, and I think Phil did a good job considering the situation under the influence he was in, on. End of the Century represents the kind of pop music that, that Joey liked so much, that he wanted to make, that he wanted to see the Ramones move towards. And it was the kind of moving away from pure, hardcore punk rock that Johnny hated seeing happen. Johnny wanted to see them be the classic first album Ramones forever and ever and ever. 
it, it isn't anybody's individual fault that we, we got thrown into this and we all tried to make the best of it, but that started the breakup and the separation of the band. Now we, we, we did an album with Phil Spector. It was our big chance. And again, we didn't sell any records, you know. So uh, at that point, I knew that I finally accepted that that's it, we didn't sell any records. That's it. It's, it's, you know, just try to maintain our career, keep making money, just, you know, a job. Just do the best we can do. Try to keep our fans happy. Don't let them down. And don't worry about it. You know, accept it. This is your spot in life. Then we start giving him more depression, you know. You know Graham Goulman, work with Graham Goulman. And this guy should be doing it. He's in 10 CC. He should be producing a Ramones record. You know, this is really ridiculous. I always thought that we worked best with Tommy and to try to get Tommy to produce records. I think he always saw what we should be doing and saw it clearly, you know. And uh, I think the band stayed more focused. More or less, Joey had the problem with him. He started to alienate a lot of people after a while. Like Tommy, for one. Um, you know, later on, uh, a lot of friends that we had from Forest Hills that we grew up with. You know, he didn't want to be reminded of the past of uh, those bad days when he was, um, you know, kind of a non-entity, you know? And he needed to forget about that. He needed to block all that out in order to be that Joey Ramone character, you know, in order to have that strength and confidence. Is there kind of a power struggle developing between you and Joey? I suppose so. Also, was there a power struggle going on in the band uh, once Tommy left the band? <laughs> this answer, come on. I guess. What, is that, what does that mean, a power struggle? Well, this power answer, struggle. do you think there's a power struggle going on? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on. It's easy to tell from someone looking at it from the outside. Once Tommy left now, the band? You were in power until a certain point then, that's all. I think you took over when Tommy left. I took over when Tommy left. Yeah. Okay, but there was a power struggle between me and Joey going on? Later on. But no, I don't think he ever wanted to be in power. He just wanted to be treated equal. Okay. But did you notice then at that point that there was, that Joey was beginning to feel that he could have a life outside the remote? Yeah. And why shouldn't he? You know, that's only normal, that everybody needs an escape fantasy. But um, we were all such a hard-working unit. You know, I didn't see Joey working any harder than me or John or Mark, that you would think the rest of the guys would, you know. Ah, there was other things going on, but I can't talk about it. Well. Mark and Dee said something happened with some girl. Right. Is that true? Well, something happened, yeah. yeah you know that. Do you want to talk about that? Well, yeah. Uh, what should I? What, what do you want me to say? Joey was seeing this girl, and John stole her away from him. Uh, that's life. Things happen. And uh, you move on, you know. I mean, you don't you don't hold a grudge towards a person in your band for uh, uh, 18 years, 17 years after that. It's a lot of girls out there, you know what I mean? Joey was very romantic, you know. I mean, hence all those love songs. And I think he really idealized love, you know. Wanted to have this one girl, you know, to hold hands with and live happily ever after. relationship he had had and then just all of a sudden she's gone with his guitar player he was really into writing you know and he wrote a lot of good songs she's a sensation and 
all that, which was a lot, was written about Linda. And um, he was really in love with her. He liked the fact that she was um, flashy looking. That made him look more like a rock star. Unfortunately, they never resolved this issue. I can't see it being intentional because, as I say, they're still together to this day. So there had to be more to it than, you know, the typical uh, thing that happens in bands where the other bandmates are jealous of the lead singer getting more attention, so I'm going to steal his girlfriend. Wasn't that. So obviously, nature took its course, and Linda and John fell in love with each other. But that was, I guess, you know, probably the biggest wedge that was driven between them two, and they never did speak to each other, really. You know, he had such inspiration artistically through this woman, and then that was it. Then it all fell apart on him, and uh, he lost his girlfriend. And probably his dream, his ambition, you know. The fact that John never talked to Joey about it, or Linda didn't either, kind of gave him the feeling that they didn't care, you know, how he felt about it. That, I think, is what really hurt him the most. You know, I can't remember any bad, direct confrontations, but the hate was there. That was the weird thing about it. They'd stay together, but they hate each other. Linda was a great reminder that he was this weirdo and that he couldn't have this great love. And she would just go marry Johnny, his worst nightmare. Creatively, I think it helped him because he wrote some songs about that, you know. I think that's the way why Joey wrote the song the KKK took my baby away. So make your own conclusions. Listen to the song carefully. She went up, went for the holidays. Said she's going to win there. But she never got there. She never got there. She never got there. They say, yeah. The gay, gay, gay took my baby away. They took her away, away from me. The gay, gay, gay took my baby away. They took her away, away from me. Van, which we always taught and it was always silent nobody would say anything and I would come up with a joke or a noise and everyone would start laughing because I couldn't take it so I had a humor of the situation create some humorous levity one day I threw a fish head out the window of a hotel into a pool people swimming that was funny he was always a laugh and a half you know but he had his problem, you know, he had a very, he was a heavy alcoholic at the time. And the only time they ever missed the show was because of him. Uh, you know, I would always talk to John and talk to Dee Dee, but nobody called anymore, you know. But uh, then I got the phone call, and Johnny Ramon had enough. So Mark, you know, you fucked up, he threw me out of the band. And I tried to pull the band together with Too Tough to Die and bring it back to its sound. One, two, three, four. I get, I get a phone call from Dee Dee, of all people. <laughs> and uh, they said, uh, you know, would you like to work with us? And I said, sure, you know. I mean, they changed a lot. You know, they already started having their own camps, which was totally new to me. Uh, they had a new drum. I came in, I played everything twice as fast. It got to the point where an hour and 15 minute set was going at 56 minutes, and the road manager would go, wait a minute, you know, we're not playing long enough. I mean, we were blitzing. often ran into them down the road. I remember I met Johnny Ramon, and he said to me, it's two minutes faster. And I said, what, what is? And he went, I'll oh, set, it's two minutes faster than it was last April. I went, my God. I particularly learned that from the Ramones, that slam, there's that number. Where's the next one? Because there's people watching you. People got things to do. It's a busy world out there, you know. Give it to them. <laughs>
The 80s were a rough period. We were the only band out there doing this. I mean, you, you, you kept doing it because of, uh, you didn't know how to do anything else. This was your job. But we knew the 80s, there was no chance. <laughs> MTV didn't really have a lot of concentrated play in the early days. They were very thankful for anything that was handed to them. So if you handed a Ramones video, they would have played it. And as they got tighter and got more corporate, the Ramones were sort of kicked out. I think MTV destroyed music. <laughs> they just started seeing themselves a bit too godlike. You know what I mean? If you didn't have a video that cost a half a million dollars, you wouldn't get aired. We were out there by ourselves. Yep. Rough period. Live show was still good, so we're coming out to see the live show. Well, it's really great to be here in New Hampshire this evening. Playing for all you wild people out there. We'd like to dedicate this one to Kevin. Take it, dude. One, two, three, four. Kevin Lee Ramone. Then after Richie leaves the band, well, I'm never really sure what reason, but she just left the band. See, what the Ramones was, I was Richard Ramon when you wanted me to be, but then I was just the hired guy when you wanted me to be. And you gotta remember, there was a lot of money in T-shirts made. When it came to T-shirt money, I wasn't a Ramon. And this is after five years, you know? I felt I was due. I wasn't asking for the world. I felt I should get a little of that T-shirt money. What's the big deal? Would I have to introduce you to our newest member, Marky e. Ramon, yeah? Now, the thing with the Ramones that was also important is that they were troubadours. They constantly were out there going around the world. He kind of took it for granted after a while because they were always there. They were always great. They always looked the same. You know, it's like, no matter how much time went by, it seemed like they were trapped in some sort of like time bubble where they wouldn't change and never seemed to get any older or look any different. These bizarre trends would come and go and then you'd go see the Ramones and be like, how many year is it anyway? Here we were, these kids, and their records got to us in a place where we didn't fit in. You know, everybody, everybody in this band, when they first heard the Ramones, it was like, whoa, finally a band for us. If it would have only been virtuosos that I would have looked up to as a little kid, then I would have never gotten started. And when I discovered stuff like the Ramones, it all clicked in my head. I realized that music was something that I could do right now. There were no standards after the Ramones. All you had to, to do is just be yourself. And that gave me a lot of self-esteem when I needed it, and confidence. So, you know, came back, I was sober, and things were fine, except uh, the tension between Johnny and Joey was still there. And I thought, Jesus Christ, how long are you going to hold on to this shit? You know what I mean? But Joey held it in, you know, I didn't let it go. Joey never got over anything. Joey could carry a grudge like an elephant never forgets. Dee Dee, when I finally left, he wanted to go too, and I think he managed to hang on another year or something and do shows in like uh, track pants or rap pants. <laughs> he became a rapper for a while, one of the first white rappers, and uh, started dressing in his rap clothes before he <laughs> before he go put on his Ramones clothes. Alarm clock ringing, it's time to get up. It's time to do that funky strut. I'm a funky man, I got funky bones above. There was one time we went to Washington where he, <laughs> he got on the plane. He was wearing his sweats and his big gold chain. He was like in the rap outfit. And we're all looking at him, saying, "What's you know?" John was like pissed. You know. Stop, 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 and start talking like a rapper and everything else, and talking like a black person. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> when Schooly D came out with that album, and you would say, what time is it? 
And it's Gucci time, you know. I understood that. It's rising above oppression, you know. A Negro being able to buy a Gucci watch, great, you know. I'm a Negro too. I felt the same excitement when I could buy a Gucci watch and spend a lot of money, like an outlaw. I don't think it it was worth fighting over. It wasn't so good anyway, the album, you know. I, was, I couldn't do rap. I was trying. I don't know how. I'm not good enough to know. I don't... You know, I'm not a Negro or something. I don't know what it is. I just can't do it. I wanted to. Didi Ramon says he's left the seminal New York punk group. In an interview with MTV News this past Monday, Didi told us that the Ramones' constant touring has jeopardized his health and his determination to avoid drugs and alcohol. He also said that he'd been hit hard by his recent divorce and that he was very enthusiastic about working full-time with his new rap band, Strength. A Ramones spokesperson was cautiously optimistic that Didi might change his mind noting that he'd quit the group a number of times before. I was sick. I was bulimic and anorexic. And nobody, you know, could tell because I was so on so many antidepressants, I was bloated from them. And I was dying. Mussolini slept here a few nights. <laughs> I want to go home. Oh. You know what? I had it. It was just too miserable. Joey was drinking so much then. Finally, I said, I got to get better. I felt kind of, like, hurt by it because uh, I always, me and Didi had always discussed, we're going to do this until we both decide, me and you don't want to do this anymore. Didi was the main songwriter. And when he left, I felt that it was like Paul McCartney leaving the Beatles. How can you replace a guy like Didi Ramon you can physically put somebody in his shoes, but you're not going to get the same uh, aura, image, and quality of songwriting as you did with Dee Ramon. thinking of the positives. Okay, everybody going around me going, oh, you guys got to break up now. You can't play with that D. What do you mean you can't play with it? You know, I'm finding somebody else, that's all. I mean, I'm going to break up. Are you crazy? I'm going to break up because Dee quits the I'm just going to accept defeat and lose, yeah? And I was just at that point determined that to prove them. Anybody that was around, we're wrong. So I thought, all right, this will be easy. Let's find a young Dee come down there and uh, somebody was like a Dee clone. <laughs> and that's Johnny Ramone right there. Yeah. And this is Joey. And that's CJ, our new bass player. I made it. And it's a real exciting time with uh, CJ in the band and Dee Dee leaving, having left the band, you know. Actually, uh, I feel he did us a real favor by leaving the band. CJ was great. He was like a breath of fresh air, man, when he came into the group. Whew. Take it, CJ. I guess in the beginning, I just kept my mouth shut and I just watched because I knew if I was going to survive in the band, I would have to understand the dynamics of the relationships between the guys. And, you know, I would definitely have to have some kind of relationship with each guy. It was so weird because Johnny is like ultra conservative and Joey is ultra liberal. Politically, we're always on opposite, opposite ends, you know? Were you always right wing? Me? Yeah, probably since I was Young. 10 years old. I was, a, I was a Nixon man in 1960. Now, Joey turned out to be a New York left wing Jewish, left wing Jew. You know, when he was there at every Save the Starving Namibians or the Rwanda Burundians or whatever. We are here in support of Jerry Brown. He addresses the issues, understands the problems, and is courageous and adamant enough to challenge not only the Bush administration, but America's entire political structure. These guys were opposites. They're like a married couple that were total opposites. But they had one thing in common. They knew they were the Ramones. Yo, what's up? A lot of you didn't vote last year. A lot of you weren't even registered. If you think that keeps the politicians up at night, forget it. A lot of them don't want you to vote. That's why they make registering so hard. <laughs> Makes what? 
Washington, what are you afraid of? You know, I really liked Joey. I really liked him, you know, and and I really respected Johnny, you know. But like I said, Johnny was always kind of like a father figure to me, and it was hard to like have like a friendship with him. Me and Joey started to, to develop a, a, a good relationship, you know, and we got to be, started getting to be kind of friends, and that's when he, I think Johnny really didn't like me much for a while there. It's not that he didn't like me or whatever, or maybe he just got, was frustrated by me because he could not understand me. In fact, one time, Joey was really sick, and. We were just doing show after show, and it was winter time, and and, I, and we were in the van. I said to Joey, I was like, you know, why don't you just say something? Why don't you just speak up and say that you can't do it? You know what I mean? The, the, this tour schedule is ridiculous, man. And the next morning, I walked down to the lobby, and Johnny was there, and he was like, who the fuck do you think you are? And just keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. And, you know when you get so mad that the tears start to well up in your eyes? That's where I, that's the point I was at. I think, honestly, to tell you the truth, is that that is how Johnny knew to do it. You just keep going and you keep going and you don't let up. You just go and go and go and go and go. And I, maybe that's all that Johnny knew. Johnny was, was the glue. He managed the band's financial affairs on the road. He was tough. Joey, on the other hand, respected Johnny for his business acumen. And uh, Joey had money. And if any time during those 20 years Joey wanted to leave, Joey could have left. And uh, he didn't. What he did need was he needed the fix. The fix being the remote. <laughs> up on stage it's a whole it's just another world up there and nothing else matters there's another whole high that's probably one of the reasons they stayed together so long the Ramones really are it's honest and it's pure energy and it gets handed down through the generations the kind of fans that we have it's not just one set person you know it's like kids into metal and alternative and all age people you go to South America they were like the Beatles down there it's incredible Y además, exclusivos de cada uno de los Ramones. Oh, it's like insane. Going back to the airport, the kids were like following us in convoys of cars and hanging out of windows and stuff. Express a little bit, a little catharsis about their situation, how bad the situations are. It's like London in 76. The kids see no future. And again, is the rawness of the message that these kids get. Playing like a, the soccer stadium with 30,000 people, you know. It's great. You can see what they could have turned into everywhere else and come back to the United States and have to play these clubs. Like the Delphi Little Club in Providence or something, you know? It was very depressing. I guess, you know, I guess it's a little tougher for a band that was the catalyst. And um, it always seems like it's the pioneers who, they don't get the full glory. Boy, you know, it's like the bands that come after, because they, they do it a little differently, or they make it a little, uh, they compromise the sound, so they break through, or they, you know, they're a little more of a mainstream kind of a, an act kind of a thing. When alternative music started to hit, that was our chance to break, and we were right there, we were on that threshold. Plus, you had everybody from Nirvana to Soundgarden trumpeting, you know, yeah, the Ramones, the Ramones, Rancid, all the biggest selling bands would fit in with those bands, and we just couldn't break it. I think that's the point where they were like, we're done. FM 1063, Modern Rock of the Jersey Shore. Joey, I'm sure everybody's been asking this question over and over again, so I just want to get it out of the way. Adios Amigos supposedly is the title because you guys are supposedly calling it quits, but then there's been talk on the internet that maybe you're not. I mean... No, we, we, uh, this, this is probably our last area performance. Mm -hmm. um, we made an agreement, 
uh, we've been doing this for 21 years, and right. um, you know it's been great and all, but um, uh, this is gonna be our last album, studio album, and um, the band's gonna like we're gonna we're calling it a retirement uh, as of maybe next February. I just went in there, changed my clothes, just walked out. Goodbye, anybody? Not that I remember. Maybe I said, maybe I said, you know, see you later. I don't know. <laughs> you know, Joey took everything that was wrong with him and made it beautiful, which I always thought was the greatest thing about Joey, you know? Like, and, and the whole philosophy of punk and the, you know, you take everything that's shitty and you celebrate it and make it good. But he was to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, a liberator. He liberated them from their own sense of failure, unpopularity. So he was a hero because he overcame the odds. He triumphed over geekiness, and he started off an alien and the world in which he was raised. Joey was never the healthiest person in the world, but he was the, one of the strongest people I've ever known. You know, and he managed to fight off anything and everything all the time. So. You know, it was, one had the impression that he was going to go on for, you know, forever, you know? He was totally convinced that he was going to leave. He was completely convinced. Four days before he died, he was refusing to get, to be fed by tubes on his throat because he didn't want his vocals cause damage. But at this time, you know, of course, you know, I didn't want to accept that he didn't like me or wasn't my friend or didn't care or thought I had something against him, you know. So I blame it on the mother and the brother and Arturo, you know, anybody but him, you know. And so, you know, why couldn't I have had a one last conversation with the guy? If you don't get along with somebody, it's all of a sudden go, uh, well, I, I, I should have talked or something. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, you know. I, I, I'm only going to be the way I'd want someone to react to me, you know? And, and if someone, uh, if I didn't like someone, I wouldn't want them calling me up if I was dying. I wouldn't want them to have any regrets for not talking to me. I'm happy that they didn't talk to me, I, you know? I couldn't, you know, if I'm gone, that's how it goes, you know? I, I, I assume because of the way he looked, you know? He didn't want me to see him in this condition, you know? which was very painful for me because, you know, I wanted to connect with him, you know? Yeah, no, I, I cared. I mean, I cared, but, I, you know, I, I cared because I couldn't help but care. I cared, you know? You know, I was wondering, why am I caring so much? But I cared, you know? I, I was questioning it to myself. Why am I caring? I'm, de I'm depressed for the whole week here. I'm, I'm sad. Why am I feeling this way? And I didn't really get along. Uh, so it bothered me. So. Did you ever think about why that was? I'm not sure. I don't know if that's, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, I still wonder if it's a weakness inside. I don't know. What, 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 I'm not sure why. He's a member of the Ramones. I love the Ramones. He's a member of the Ramones. So, I mean, uh, we're all in it together, you know? Mm -hmm. Even if we didn't get along or whatever, if someone did something to him, I'd be wanting to defend him. If I saw someone throw something at him, I, I'd want to go get the person. I mean, I, I cared, you know, because that I took as an insult to the to the Ramones. So in that way, you know, it's, it's uh, we're in it together. <laughs> I'd like to thank Seymour Stein for everything he's done for the Ramones for our whole career. Danny Fields, our first manager. Gary Kerfurst, who's managed us for the last 22 years. And Ramones fans who made this all worthwhile. Uh, God bless President Bush and God bless America.
Hi, everybody. I'm Marky Ramone, and I want to thank John and Ramone for asking me to join the Ramones. What would I have done without them? Nothing. Probably would have been dead a million times. The Ramones definitely saved me. <laughs> I don't know why I'm so sour. I keep on, you know, the whole thing is like, well, I guess it's like was an ugly life somehow. It's not easy being in a rock and roll band. Yeah, I will. I'm going to come back and sing Que Minutes. Okay. I'm practicing for Brazil. All right. Oh, God. Poor G. of CDs and Ramones was magical. So it was fitting that Joey, who was the blunt singer of the band, gets his corner named after him. Yeah.